They say when you wear Black Power Media gear, you can accomplish anything. You can play any and every position. Coaching, to kicking, to receiving, to running and juking. And, oh, my goodness. Let's see how to get in slow motion. Get off me. Ah. And you're going to have a lot of haters coming at you. But what you got to do is you got to shake them off. Shake them off and get to your goal and accomplish it. And when that's done, it's a beautiful thing. I'm talking about going hard, extra, for that extra point. And when it's done beautifully, you're talking about touchdown. Oh, and the crowd goes wild and they're celebrating with you and everything. Man, let's see that again. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. That's how we do it. Now go to blackpowermedia.org and get you some of that gear. Empower yourself today. Yeah. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What I like, what I like, what I like. Hey, hey, what's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here at Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. Uh, Before we move any farther, please do make sure uh, you are all liked up. Make sure you share, subscribe if you can, uh, support the platform in any number of different ways. Uh, Blackpowermedia.org included among them all the material and immaterial ways you can help uh, the project that we're all involved in here continue to expand. So thank you in advance. Uh, time is a little bit limited, so I don't want to waste too much more. We can we can come back and talk more about uh, all the other things uh, at another time or in addition to or after the fact. But I just want to say before we bring up our next guest, one of my, generationally speaking, one of the, the, the my more favorite activists, um, And as I've said here before, along with Kamal Franklin, uh, our next guest was one of the primary uh, reasons why I ended up joining at one point the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement uh, and have always looked to follow his brother's work and learn from and be inspired by that work. Uh, And uh, very happy to bring up our next guest now, who, among many other things, is a leader in the movement Uh, known as Jackson Rising, Cooperation Jackson, most specifically. Again, a veteran of the Malcolm X grassroots movements and many movement and many other formations, political, politically active and organizing spaces for a long time. And and most recently, not only is uh, the Jackson Rising Redux book been recently published this year, covering the history of Cooperation Jackson and, and many other things, uh, in which we, our next guest has many featured contributions, but he has also th- been named this year the Gandhi Peace Award winner. So we're very fortunate to have with us uh, for the next roughly hour or so, Kali Akuno. Brothers, good to see you again. Welcome, welcome back, and congratulations here, on the most recent award. Appreciate it, appreciate it. Good to see you, good to be here. Um, so... A number of things to get to. Let me let me first. I wanted to actually, if I could, because I um, and I hate to say it this way, but I was kind of being just reminded again of some of these histories and and folks involved as I was trying to prepare for today. And I did want us to start before we move any farther with you saying a word or two about Chokwe Lumumba, uh, mm-hmm. the, the whose name features in in the Jackson Rising work and Redux book and uh, who was at least pictured in the recent Dear Mama uh, series on Tupac, but not mentioned or discussed. I thought, you know, obviously you, you, you knew him quite well. If you would just say a word or two about him uh, before we move on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I haven't seen that, that series. And uh, good. But I, You're not, yeah. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, I, I was, I, I'm kind of trying to, save myself some frustration and disappointment to be honest with the audience. But um, uh, I heard he was in it, you know, and a lot of folks are in it. And so for folks who don't know, you know, uh, Chokwe served as a uh, uh, Tupac's lawyer uh, on a few occasions. Uh, and that is, uh, was not by happenstance. Number one, he was one of the premier movement lawyers that we had you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, on, on into the 2000s. Um, he was, for uh, far too short a time, he was the uh, mayor of the city of Jackson. Um, uh, he served as a city councilman, basically, uh, from 2009, 2013, and then as mayor from 2013 uh, to part of 2014. But before that, 
right? So that's where, if you go look at most of these biographies now, that, those are the things that people will, will kind of highlight. Uh, and I would caution that that's, that was kind of a brief episode uh, in, in his history, uh, a very, very revolutionary uh, history. You know, uh, uh, he was a member of uh, the Republic of New Africa, uh, was a student of uh, uh, Amari Obadele, uh, who was one of the uh, founders of the Republic of New Africa, along with his brother Gaidi uh, Obadele, uh, who were members of uh, Gold, based out of uh, uh, Detroit, Michigan. And I'm bringing this up so you folks understand some of the connection, because if you ever heard uh, Message to the Grassroots uh, or the Battle to the Bullet, that was Malcolm coming to Detroit speaking on, on, on occasion of going up uh, to meet with the, the Henry brothers that they were known at the time, the Milton, uh, 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 with Gold up in Detroit. And that's who recorded that. It was on that session. And this particular reason why some of those speeches, you know, de-emphasize the nation of Islam and, and appear to be much more radical in their focus than some of the other things that uh, he talked about. Well, these were some of uh, Chokwe's uh, students, uh, I mean, teachers, you know, knowing that um, they, along with Queen Mother Moore and many other people, uh, were instrument, instrumental uh, in the development of uh, what became known as the provisional government of a um, uh, government in exile, in effect, of the Republic of New Africa, which got founded in Detroit uh, in March 1968. So Chokwe was a student of that. Uh, he uh, wound up becoming one of the leaders in the, uh, the campaign against COINTELPRO, right, the national uh, uh, Black Human Rights Coalition in the 1970s, in which he worked and co-founded that with the Faini Shakur. So that was, you know, a part of the history which is uh, not put in context or not uh, discussed in that film, or, or like many other things politically that she was involved in. Um, so, you know, father, uh, his son is the mayor of Jackson now, Shokwe Anton Lumumba. His daughter is running for uh, a legislative seat. Uh, Rukia Lumumba, both of them are activists in their own uh, rights. Um, you know, long, long legacy. I can, I can go on. He was, yeah, I yeah. would say this, yeah. to be clear so folks can look up the history. He was one of the founders of the New African People's Organization and one of the founders of the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, uh, which was, was started here in 1990 uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. So we can go on and on about Chokwe, but right, uh, yeah, I just I, I I appreciate that. I know, and I, I somewhat put you on the spot with that, knowing you could handle it, of course. But I just wanted to, uh, I, I, again, in preparation for today, a little bit trying to be. His name just kept popping up, and I was like, wait a minute, we should we should you know say a word or two because you know, and he's just too many good people's names are just uh, you know become Erased background. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know exactly. I wasn't sure exactly where we could start today. I, I, I definitely want to have you break down from your perspective. What does it mean to be engaged in cooperative economics and how does Cooperation Jackson operate? Uh, but I do know that that uh, a couple of weeks ago when I had put up a, 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 a clip of Du Bois talking critically about cooperatives and then saying myself my own criticism, it was I think it was misinterpreted by some that I was talking about Cooperation Jackson and your work in particular. So so uh, I would just want to be clear, for the most part, and I'm trying to think, I'm not aware of any instances, I may be missing something, but I'm not aware of any instances where I have a criticism of someone or something and I haven't shared it with them or said it publicly. So in other words, if I had, if I, if the video had right. been meant to be critical of you or Cooperation Jackson, I would have said it. I wasn't honestly ever thinking of Cooperation Jackson or your work when putting that together. I was thinking more specifically about some of the academic work around cooperatives, but also I was I was in part because I, I think I know you well enough to know and I know the work that Cooperation Jackson is attempting well enough to know uh, that you're not engaging this work from my humble perspective as with the understanding that this is it, this is all that needs to be done. There's no. no other activity we need to be engaged in. This solves all the contradictions known to humanity. So on and so 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 I was like, that's why I was like, I'm not, it, it was never anyway. So, but I, I didn't want to allow you to 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 respond or say anything you'd like to say uh or to clear clarify and then just talk specifically about the work you've been engaged in, of course. Uh but yeah, go ahead. Uh oh, did you freeze? 
Please tell me he didn't just freeze. Oh no. Uh oh, I think you froze up for a second. Yeah, Kylie, do me a favor. See if you can reconnect real quick. Uh, hold on. Uh, I think you're you you're just frozen up. Um, damn. So maybe try to jump out and jump back in if you can. Um, uh, and by the way, while while we get this this corrected, I will uh, in the show description already is the video that I had done. Uh, uh, um, specifically playing a clip of a speech from Du Bois talking at the end of his life about, critically, about his prior experience with cooperatives. I'm going to also, and I've also put the link to Cooperation Jackson in the uh, show description if anybody is not already familiar. And uh, I thought that was, and I'll add the link to the, uh, what I put in the, sh the chat already, which is a classic uh, speech um, that we still have it. I mix what I like from Chokwe Lumumba, um, which by the way was a dope day because I used to, there was a time when that speech took place. Let's see, this was 20, when was this? This was, I think, anyway, I'll come back to that. I think we got Kylie back. Let's just jump back in here. I'll come back to that story later. Yeah, my, my you know, Yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good. I think you did. Did you hear everything I was saying? Are you? I heard. I heard okay. most of what you were saying, and I was just starting to respond. Okay. And now you locked up again. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, uh, Jackson decided to to, to, to show up, <laughs> or somebody else did. Anyway, wait. anyway, I'm, in terms of our, our our conditions, can you hear me now? Wait, say that still, again, because I think you froze back. up again. It, it 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 froze up again. So let's try that last part again. My bad. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was saying I was just starting to talk after after you had raised the points, and then then it froze on me. You know, so uh, for that I would say, you know, welcome to our conditions here in Jackson. We we are <laughs> we exist in a city, unfortunately, where the infrastructure is collapsing. So, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that facetiously. I'm saying that. Uh, uh, as a as a realistic point of, uh, of you know where our development is at this particular point in time, right? Um, mm -hmm. And this is intentional, right? Like I can go, I can go out, out to the suburb uh, and get you know fiber optic uh, uh, cable and all that. I'm sitting basically you know uh, half a mile from downtown uh, Jackson, uh, and I can't get you know the latest access to technology fiber optic. Uh, and they've been out here like fixing, claiming to be fixing stuff now for the past couple of couple of months as it's been uh, messing with some of our programming, you know, which has become more digital as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and so we become more reliant and dependent upon it for communications or doing things like this. Uh, and it don't work. But anyway, let me let me let me get back to your to your to your question. Um, yeah, no, I was just I was saying, number one, I appreciate that, that you. Um, pulled up that video of the boys, pulled up that interview, ra rather, I should say, um, you know, because a lot of the, the critical works uh, of some of our preeminent scholars and, and uh, academics. Damn. I think you I mean, locked up again. Hold on a second. Through the night. Kali, it's locking up again. Try, try, yeah. It's, it's messing up again. There you go. Yeah, yeah. You, you just as you were saying some about the scholars of this certain era, something, something. Yeah. All right, <laughs> all right. Uh, Jackson tried my patience this morning. The internet tried my patience. Uh, uh, yeah. No, I, I was saying once for putting it out. Um, yeah, and maybe. For, wait, wait, for, real quick. Maybe we should try that. Maybe we should try having you do audio only, uh, and that might help. If we, okay. if you turn your camera off, um, I don't think I can do it from here. That but if you I turn your camera it. off, yeah, now you're only in the, you're, you're here, but only in audio. And, okay. and let's see if that works. Is that better? Uh, yeah, so far, yeah. So far. Then, mm -hmm. Okay, well, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's a good thing that I'm past my prime of, of, of beauty anyway. So, oh, okay, uh, all right, right, right. Uh, okay. <laughs> So you ain't, you ain't gonna miss nothing by me not being on on, on camera. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, hopefully this works. So uh, this thing keep getting interrupted. I was just saying, number one, I appreciated that you 
pull that interview up um, and that you, you brought up Dr. Du Bois's work and put it in some historical context. Uh, because, you know, number one, he's not studied enough. Uh, number two, a lot of the things that have been uh, written about him really don't deal with the breadth of his life. You're talking about a 90-something year life with a lot of political views changing in the course of his life. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and so a lot of his views get taken out of context in terms of the journey that he was on and points that he clarified himself over the, the course of his life. Uh, whether we agree or disagree with those points, you know, where he ended and how he summarized his life, I think was pretty clear. Uh, but when you played that interview, uh, you know, a couple of folks hit me up, uh, I think on the basis of knowing how uh, the Black Reconstruction in America, uh, which I still think is one of the, I have to agree with Amir Barack on that, but I think it's probably one of the best written books uh, dealing with so-called U.S. or North American history, point blank period. Uh, but how that book was very instrumental um, and, and Darkwater, another one of his works, uh, were very instrumental in the, in the formation of a lot of the thinking that went into the development of Cooperation Jackson and further the Jackson Cush plan. So I, a couple of folks who I won't name, but you know, they haven't got per, given me permission to, to articulate some stuff. They sent, they sent me that was like, yo, what, what, why is this being dog? And I, I listened to it and I was like, no, there's nothing. Uh, uh, I don't hear anything uh, of Cooperation Jackson being uh, criticized. And if you want to get to the point where uh, Du Bois was, was correcting his own uh, ideas uh, and his own thoughts, and said that is a particular piece that we agree with uh, and that I personally would agree with and something that we tried to learn from. Uh, and in fact, there's a there's a short statement. Uh, it, it doesn't phrase it the same way, but there's a phrase that we've been using from the beginning about uh, cooperation, Jackson, and our orientation is that you know we're just we don't do co-ops for co-op sake, right? Uh, that's not the aim and, and objective. Uh, you know, we think that the cooperatives and the tools of the solid social and solidarity economy can be used as something to help liberate black people uh, by democratizing the, the economy, democratizing the means of production, uh, developing democratic subjects. We think they can all be helpful, but quite honestly, if these tools don't work to get us where we, we need to go, we'll find something else. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, it's more of a form following function, uh, particular piece that we are, are pursuing. And as things, you know, conditions shift and change uh, and, and we have to shift and change with them, we will, will do so. Uh, we want everybody to be be clear uh, uh, about that. Um, and for us, you know, the the particular uh, piece, folks have to understand cooperation Jackson in the context of a broader strategy, which is the Jackson Cush plan, and how we were born to be an instrument of one particular element of that plan, uh, which was to try to transform the local means of production to greater enable uh, uh, and you know, a black liberation and build a material base uh, for our liberation politics, you know, what, with the understanding that uh, economics, you know, that, that uh, politics without economics is symbol without substance. Um, you know, and we wanted folks to be very clear that in the, in the terms of the pursuit of the electoral politics, you know, winning office, which we did a couple of times very clearly, uh, that we all understood that that was not sufficient to get us where we needed to go. Uh, that, you know, we've had black mayors now for the past 50 years all over the place, and the condition in most of our communities hasn't fundamentally changed nowhere. Uh, so, you know, starting with that understanding, uh, we wanted to make sure that we at least got on the journey of trying to seize and develop the means of production and put them squarely in the hands of the black working class uh, to build up our, our overall capacity uh, to withstand the onslaughts of capitalism and white supremacy. So that's what we're here trying to do. You know, we ain't we far from accomplishing that. Uh, and you're not going to accomplish that in 10 years anyway, uh, 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 realistically. But uh, we wanted to start that journey. And I think we've, we've started that. It's not without its conflicts. It's not without its contradictions. It's not without its setbacks. Our history is, I think, uh, uh, very clear about that. Uh, but we started a journey. And I, I think we've made the right decision in starting that and trying to articulate a, a clear path 
uh, of what type of struggles need to take place uh, on the economic and social fronts to help move the needle towards liberation, if only slightly. Uh, uh, that's what we are at. And I think that is what Du Bois was talking about in that particular piece, where the, the, the self-correction, where he said very clearly, you know, at one point in time, he thought uh, developing kind of a broad set of kind of like consumer oriented cooperatives uh, could be a liberatory tool of utilizing black collective, black purchasing power uh, to be able to affect greater political change. And what he learned, particularly through the Great Depression, where, uh, uh, you know, black land ownership was, was drastically reduced. Uh, you know, uh, black workers wind up being uh, totally removed from key sectors or, or moved into key sectors that were deeply impoverished. And he read, he had the growth, you know, to be honest with himself and saying, if we are totally dependent upon purchasing, purchasing power, uh, we are going to be limited because we are, that doesn't eliminate our role as slave, as basically slave labor, but as wage labor uh, within this economy because we don't own enough uh, uh, as the, the capitalist economy articulated to, to shift relations or productions uh, or to demand anything by terms of market share within the, the, uh, uh, the overall economy uh, that would fortify kind of our position to be bargainers or, or uh, to negotiate with capital and then negotiate with the state. Uh, so that was his clear realization and is one that, you know, myself and others tried to build upon. So uh, we agree with his analysis and tried to build upon it uh, in the work that we did some 50 years later. Right on. So I appreciate that. Uh, uh, and again, you, you know, uh, well, no, no, again, that's it. That's it. So let me let me ask. Let me try to do it this way. Um, so, folks, uh, as you see here, uh, I think you see here, right? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, my, my Kindle here. So I encourage people to get the, the initial Jackson Rising book. Uh, I forgot exactly when that came out. Was it is it ten years already? I don't even. No, 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 bro. <laughs> Not that long, right? It feels that long. Twenty seventeen when it. Twenty seventeen, right? Right. Everything seems so far away before the pandemic. But then in this year, the the Jackson Rising Redux, uh, I'm still working through. I, I encourage people to check that out as well. And but so so I so but in that you make reference to this book by John Sibley Butler, and you mm -hmm. say that that his book. Uh, uh, provides a strong basis for how you all approach cooperatives. So I did want to say very quickly one, and I'll, and I'll continue to leave an open invitation to her. You know, we, we, I just humbly slightly disagree with her approach. That is Jessica Gordon M. Hard, who's, whose essay in Jackson rising redux. Um, I do think inaccurately, you know, situates Du Bois so that in, in support of her uh, 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 approach to uh, cooperatives. But but yeah, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to you know, I just want to put that out there, you know, um, but I do want to ask you about the Butler book in particular uh, and, and, and as a segue to invite you and you can respond to anything, obviously, but to, as, yeah. to talk more about how you all approach cooperatives, um, because I have not read the entire book. I've only just just read through it a little bit, but he does seem to say in the book he seems to be making the point one point he does make is that that and he concludes the book by saying that um uh black business not necessarily cooperatives per se but black entrepreneurialism has not solved the problems that 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 it, it's not it has not been a, a solution to the problem of black and economic inequality um yeah. But he also talks specifically, this is where I really want to go with the question. He, he seems to be saying, that is Butler, that there is something cultural or ethical in terms of business ethics that black people have lost being so far removed from, as he talks about, the, the immigration experience of enslavement for black people. The point being that, as he says, the the, the farther removed immigrants are from that initial immigration moment, the less they maintain an ethic and a culture of entrepreneurialism. I to the extent I understand his argument, I really struggle with it. I do not agree with it. I think that that is not the problem. And so, so I'm saying all that to say, Mm -hmm. If there's anything that I've said that you want to clarify, please. But really, I'm and saying all that to say, I'm inviting you to explain how you do approach cooperative economics, or how does Cooperation Jackson approach cooperative economics? In other, in, in, and and um, 
uh, how do they actually work? Or how right. do you see right. it working? Right. Yeah. Well, let me let me start again by saying, you know, our, our approach from the beginning is, is never been that that uh, we do co-ops for, for co-ops sake. Um, you know, um, and in that vein, uh, we've always been critical of the stand, what I'm going to call the standard model of cooperative development, which is a model which is geared towards entrepreneurialism, uh, which is to give a summary breakdown. And this is not in the book. This is something that in, in a forthcoming work uh, that, that I am going to outline a little bit clearer. Um, but your standard model says, okay, you know, um, you gather a group of folks who have a kind of a like-minded interest. Like we, we all like uh, baking cakes, right? Uh, and so I wanna, I wanna start a cake business primarily uh, because that's my passion, uh, but also because I wanna change some elements of my working and living conditions. I wanna make more income. I wanna work uh, uh, under terms and conditions that are favorable to me. Meaning, you know, I want to work at the hours I want to work. Uh, I want to work under kind of conditions, uh, uh, you know, that I can more readily control. Uh, and so I, I get together with my partners uh, and we come up with a plan. We do some market research. You know, we, we see what's viable, uh, what, quote unquote, the capitalist market will kind of bear. Uh, and then we come up with that. You broke you broke up there a little bit, colleague. Can you say that last say that last try that last part again? I think you broke up again. No, I'm saying we come up with business. Uh, I was saying we come up with a business plan and like a clear division of labor. Um, you know, and then and we we set out to execute, right? And uh, we have to relate to certain market forces. Um, you know, your basic you know, supply and demand, where is there a market? We do all those things. That's just your typical model. And where the, the democracy is there is the collective decision-making um, that a cooperative employs. Uh, and then your, your distribution of resources in an equitable manner. It's not always equal. That depends upon the operating agreements that folks in the co-ops have. Like some people may make a decision, uh, hey, I don't, I don't have any kids, but somebody else has maybe two kids. Uh, so we're going to choose to give them a little bit more resources because they need them. But you can make these types of decisions internally, right, based upon your ethics, your values, and the principles that you uphold to. Now, that is, the general way of doing cooperatives in that manner, you know, is, is based upon existing within the, the kind of a, a, a established capitalist framework. And you're just trying to capture a niche or a particular market share uh, within the established market, Right. And, and to the extent that you might be able to get other businesses in, in, in either your supply chain or value chain uh, to operate along the same way, you kind of democratize, create better living conditions. You maybe even maybe garner more wages. Uh, but that is kind of the full extent of where the, the current kind of established model is really willing to go, right? Uh, because it's 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 a it's a model that's kind of framed to to exist within what exists, not to challenge what exists. And, and our model has always been, we're trying to challenge what exists, right? And so we, if, if we understand that, we have to do it a little bit differently. And uh, for us, uh, we wanted to, to, to at best possible, insulate ourselves from some of the competitive dynamics of the market, from Jump Street. And now some of this, I would say, has worked. Some of it hasn't, right? Uh, uh, and we're still young, getting into 10, 10 years of experience, and I think you know, as we go along and we made some more tweaks, time will tell. But let me make it clear that the first thing that we did, uh, rather than start cooperatives, we actually worked to establish a community land trust. That was the first thing that we did, right? We bought property. Uh, and we bought as much of it as possible, uh, um, uh, you know, just off the top buying it. We didn't we didn't take out any loans. Uh, we bought it outright. So the only thing that we have to pay fundamentally is taxes. And that was on purpose, right? We did not want any form of debt over overlooking us because that limits your options of what you can do, right? You didn't have to start working 
to kind of the service the debt to serve the interest, uh, which means you then have to respond to certain kind of market pressures and market forces. So that this was born from from previous experience I had doing a co-op that did fairly well, you know, for for a number of years. Uh, but the psychic experience was something with the, this was in California. Uh, you know, as we learned uh, uh, over like a four year time, as we learned how to make some money. By the time we got two years in and we started making money, the landlord realized that we started making money. We started working for him because he started raising the rent every six months. So it got to a point, you know, this is shortly after college, we had to just make a collective decision. Are we going to continue to work for him or are we going to continue to work for ourselves? And so we decided we ain't working for him. But the, the, the lesson we learned from that was to the greatest extent possible, never rent anything again. And that was the practice and an orientation brought to that I brought was very specifically uh, from that experience to to cooperation Jackson, uh, and uh, we were fortunate enough to have both planned and saved some money, uh, but then also got some generous donations, you know, from folks of a, who shared a like mind and vision to be able to buy some land to start with, and for that we had a commercial space which was uh, uh, the, the which is the Balagoon Center, our main center. We bought uh, uh, our first uh, house, and then we bought roughly uh, 1.5 acre of land and from there we started doing uh cooperative development on a kind of a needs-based asses assessment something that we are calling directed cooperatives right so we didn't start stuff like, like well we just like to farm or you know we just like to do bikes or we like to do a cafe it was like what are the things that we can do that are going to help enable establish a material foundation to give us greater autonomy in the local community to be able to use as a as a weapon, as a tool in this long term fight against the forces of capitalism and against the forces of white supremacy. So having land and having our own facility to do productive activities that we didn't own any debt on, that we own outright. And the only thing we had to do, again, was pay taxes. That gave us time to experiment. Right. And I, and I, I stress that being key, that gave us time to experiment. Uh, and to figure out, to try to figure out, you know, what could we do that could build both an internal economy to circulate value, goods, services to the members of the organization, kind of first and foremost, and then enable us to produce enough of a surplus that we can then go to market and sell that to market to be able to gain enough uh, uh, capital to then recirculate back to enhance our productive capacity. That is buy more tools, buy more equipment, buy more land. Etc. So we can extend the capacity over time to do that. The weakness of our model that we've come to find out is that doing direct cooperatives means that you are asking people to do things that they are not necessarily passionate about, but they may have political clarity about the need for. And political clarity and passion don't always equal the same thing, right? And so, to give an example, we've we've had uh, you know a lot of young people come in who are developing political capacity, but they're not farmers, right? And, and you know, uh, and, and food sovereignty being one of the key foundations upon which we're trying to build out. Uh, and we, we chose it as a foundation because we know food has been used as a weapon against our people. And if we can feed ourselves, it takes us out of certain kind of dynamics to where we have to work to, to, to you know, put food on the table. So instead of working a full-time job, if we could do, develop this, enough to, to, to the capacity enough to do this, we might be able to say, hey, you might be able to work a part-time job to spend more time with your kids or do more educational work or things of that nature which could enhance your capacity. But um, Kali, when I'm when well, I was when I was in the court as a kid shooting hoops, I wasn't fantasizing about being a role player and getting <laughs> rebounds. <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't fantasizing about picking up that sixth foul, you know what I'm saying? I was, you know, so I, I that I think you make a very important point. Uh right. when we have our revolutionary freedom dreams is as whatever, we're not thinking about planting no damn. <laughs> well, you but we gotta somebody got to. I know I mean, this, you're this right. is what study is history is <laughs> why study in history is important as Malcolm taught us. Right. And shout out to Baba Oduno, folks up here know him well. There is yeah. no culture without agriculture. As he yeah, there say. you go. Yeah. That, that, that's a foundation. That is a foundation. If you can't take care of your, your, your basic caloric needs, uh, you're going to be working for somebody else and they're going to be dictating the terms and the pace 
and the quality of your life uh, are based upon your health. So, um, so anyway, that's that's the 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 issue with some of the directed cooperatives. You just get into a level of self criticism. Is that you know, as I was saying, we we brought in folks who, uh, you know, they may want and need a job. Uh, we have something on offer, but it's not necessarily their passion to be farmers. They have to learn how to be farmers. Uh, and farming kind of is one of those things that, like, to a degree, if you ain't got no passion for it, uh, you're trying to get in and out that field, or in and out that hot heat, particularly like we got here in Mississippi, very quickly. So some of the turnover in that is 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 it's pretty extreme be, yeah. but the the critical piece is uh, uh us trying to develop the productive capacity that we can feed ourselves so that is where we start with not like a hobby and not something oriented and we've always been clear that from the beginning you know anybody who, who looks at agriculture in the united states knows that it's a it's a field that's highly subsidized mm -hmm. the highly subsidized field uh, uh for a lot of different reasons right um you know the the transformation to industrial uh, 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 agriculture that happened beginning basically in the 1930s uh, was a to kind of feed the industrial, the expanding industrial capacity of the United States empire, uh, to free up access to more land, to free up access to for more mining rights and utilization of more water with hydroelectric, you know, dams and things of, of that nature that they needed uh, to do and, and eventually did. Uh, but they wanted to remove as many people from the land so they 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 would wind up being forced into the, the you know, direct wage uh, uh, earning, uh, you know, positions basically become proletarians uh, because they needed that labor in the factories. And you kind of, you know, most folks historically do not want to work uh, uh, in cubicles. They do not want to work, you know, uh, running a car line or running a steel plant. You got to force people into doing that type of work. You know, you got to create conditions that shape people happen to be dependent upon this. Uh, and so that's what that's what happened. But this the large subsidy that happens in agriculture means that doing small agriculture is really not that profitable. So us understanding and knowing that, we've always been kind of clear that we have to get a certain level of, of organizational subsidization, but also community kind of subsidization, community buy-in to be able to subsidize building up this farming kind of, uh, uh, this agriculture capacity. Uh, but the critical thing is, it's the politics and understanding you're doing this because you do not want food to be used as a weapon against you, as we have witnessed historically in black communities, but particularly here in Mississippi, Louisiana. Um, you know, uh, the most recent uh, uh, event, if to make it clear what I'm talking about, look at how the United States government uh, used food and access to land during Hurricane Katrina to displace, you know, uh, roughly about a million black folks. Uh, uh, from the Gulf South, about four, you know, about three hundred thousand black folks in in New Orleans alone, many of which have not been able to return, and the plan was for them never to return. So us understanding that being, do you remember who was who was the politician? Man, that's another bit of history getting washed away, pun intended. But who was the politician that said something like, uh, um, "God did what we've been trying oh, yeah, to do uh, through man, policy"? I forget his name. He was the Louisiana senator. Yeah, he said. Uh, God, uh, uh, we couldn't do it, but God could, you know, did it basically. The you point know, being, get rid of all these black residents, yeah, all these black residents of the project, so they could build a Disneyland yep. in the South, something yep. like that. Yeah, yeah, or in, in that so, region or whatever. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, so so our orient orientation has to to figure out, you know, uh, and to think through what are the core strategic needs uh, of a community to, to be able to facilitate its own productive capacity and not have to be dependent upon outside resources and outside productive capacity to be able uh, to have the greatest amount of autonomy and, and flexibility. So we focus in on food sovereignty. We focus in on low scale uh, 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 industrial production. That's what our community production cooperative uh, uh, is and has been about. Uh, we focus in on, on uh, uh, a certain level of um, regenerative uh, practices through uh, composting, through uh, uh, trying to heal the soils uh, through composting, but also kind of manicured uh, lawn care since large parts of, you know, Mississippi and large parts of, you know, Jackson have a lot of 
uh, available in open land and with the, the kind of the decomposition of the, the urban environment. In, the, in our case, the city is shrinking, has been shrinking for a while in terms of population. So that means we got a lot of abandoned houses and buildings. Uh, so we're trying to convert as many of those, take them off the speculative market, number one, that's the purpose of the land trust, uh, and but also convert those into some productive capacity in terms of agriculture and soil regeneration uh, to be, you know, better carbon sinks to make sure we're going to have enough good topsoil for the next three or four generations at, at minimum to be able to feed themselves. So there's some long-term uh, thinking, which is not in tune with the market, the dynamics of the of your standard market that we have always been trying to be oriented towards. Now, the the I think the thinking is, is clear and solid. Uh, I would argue and defend that in a long-term basis with any and everybody. But the, the piece that we do still have to confront, yes, it is true that we've created certain conditions by owning all land and facilities uh, that we don't have to deal with certain kind of market dynamics, but that does not mean we have escaped them. So we still have the dynamic of we got people to employ, we, we're still employing you know, uh, wage labor, so there has to be some kind of market labor engagement. And we've now got you know a, a few co-ops that, that can deal with surviving in the market, but most of them are still dealing very heavily with a, a form of subsidization that is provided through kind of the nonprofit uh, uh, apparatus. Like that is the cold truth that we're still trying to work our way out of. Um, and it's going to take some time. And part of the thing, you know, uh, uh, we, we've learned very clearly that to, to think that we're going to do this alone in Jackson is also kind of a folly. We have to build a broader uh, network, you know, a, a value chain, supply chains, to be able to, to, to do goods and services and, and to aggregate up more resources that we could all use to do the type of development that we need and we want to, to build the autonomy locally that we're aiming for. And so that's why we've, we've taken it upon ourselves to you know, experiment with this form called the People's Network for Land Deliberation you know, now, uh, which is uh, uh, Cooperation Jackson, Community Movement Builders, you know, uh, 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 primarily in Atlanta, uh, cooperation, uh, Vermont, up in Vermont, and uh, uh, District of Humboldt, uh, up in Humboldt County, uh, which is uh, an organization uh, run by the Weah tribe, their indigenous uh, folks. So, uh, and then also includes Insight Focus, which is based out of Detroit, and up in Idlewild, right? And so each one of them kind of does some slightly different components in long-term thinking, uh, both in terms of climate change and climate resiliency. Uh, uh, so having some places for our folks uh, to go, but also the extension of mastering uh, elements of, of uh, political change, which you see in one form of an electoral arena historically here in Jackson. You see the more advanced aspects of, of being able to kind of defend a broader community position with what uh, a CMB is contributing to uh, with Cop City. And then you see, I think the most kind of advanced piece on the productive uh, side is what Inside Focus is doing and teaching us all about, you know, digital fabrication and the extension of that of, of, into uh, uh, what we call community production. Uh, so that's where we at. That's where our kind of co-ops are, are oriented uh, uh, towards in this ongoing uh, uh, learning journey. Uh, but we have we've been very clear from the beginning. Co-ops and and uh, community land trusts, all this stuff in and of itself, it lays a material foundation. But just doing them is not going to lead us to emancipation, right? It's not going to lead so us to liberation. Let me just ask you, because I think you got to leave in a couple of minutes. So I appreciate you doing this and, and you're welcome back anytime, as is anybody else in, in your crew and collective as often as you like. Uh, but I, let me just raise, there's two questions. Mm -hmm. Well, one, uh, thanks for the super chat, Martin Hernandez, uh, who just says, I'm halfway through Jackson Rising Redux and had the opportunity to hear Kali Akuno speak here in LA a few months back, good stuff all around. So thank you very much, Martin. Appreciate the support as well. Um, and I'm not, so I want to just, just a couple of things uh, mm -hmm. in the chat that that one relates to uh, a question about Mondragon, uh, yeah. where Tahir is asking, I've heard Kali say that the Mondragon cooperatives among workers in Basque, Spain, influence what they've done in Jackson. What would what from the Mondragon framework have they adopted? I'm very interested in that. And to the extent also, mm -hmm. if this means anything, uh, I'm not familiar with this criticism, but I've seen it mentioned a couple of times in the chat, Adolfo Minka, Claimed he lived in Jackson from 2013 to 2020. His article said he co that co-ops, quote, don't exist or function because they don't have a consistent labor force or means of production available. 
end quote, which sounds like a little bit of what you were talking about. Turn, but I don't know if that's a, if that's a fair critique or, or one you want to respond to. I'm just anyway. Though I'll just throw that out there, and then you can use them as segues to to form whatever concluding comments you have for today. Because of mm -hmm. course you're always welcome back. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean uh, the, the piece with Mondragon. Mm -hmm. um, number one, I think when that was introduced into as an idea into the broad new african independence movement this goes back to like the 70s mm -hmm. you know to my knowledge anyway may go back further but what folks were particularly looking at and how it got introduced to me was there was two kind of parallels you know one you have the the box overall uh, you know kind of independence movement right uh, uh against the, the the imposition of the castilian state the spanish in, in uh, peace and they were waging, you know, a long-term uh, positional and, and direct confrontation of war against Spanish imperialism, Spanish colonialism. And within that, this the Mondragon cooperation, cooperative network was, was born um, to, number one, try to provide jobs and develop the productive capacity of folks in the Bosque region. And that seemed very similar, I think, to folks of like, here's a, a similar dynamic to us being, you know, a, a a colonized people, colonized nation from our perspective in the new African independence movement here in the United States, and then doing something through the own utilization of your talents and developments outside of any external funding that we thought that we should look at and try to parallel in many respects in our countries. Because, you know, I think I was of the school in many respects that there's a lot to learn from other people's experiences. You know, particularly, you know, we were heavily influenced, our movements heavily influenced by the national liberation movements, you know, in, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. But one of the key kind of distinctions between those movements and ours, uh, we are nestled or have been at least nestled in the last hundred years, you know, in with, within one of the industrial superpowers of the planet, right? And so we're not dealing with uh, uh, an industrial power that's far away that's imposed upon stuff. We're dealing with industrial power that we are lived in, in kind of uh, circumscribed around. And so their experience is kind of overcoming uh, that was something that we were keen to look at. Now Mondragon, the, the model of Mondragon that we were looking at basically kind of ends around the, the, the 1990s. Mondragon made a, some, some very, the leadership of Mondragon in the 90s and 2000s made some very calculated turn to re-pivot towards kind of re-engaging the larger world market, right? And, and adopting some very clear capitalist practices. So we have not followed that in any form or fashion uh, and been very critical of that, even though I think this, there's still a lot to learn from what they have done. Uh, uh, but we, you know, you got to figure out what might translate from your context, from their context to yours and what won't. And I think, you know, in the course of some years, we definitely kind of figure out, well, this part won't, this part does, this part doesn't. But there are, uh, uh, so folks know in terms of looking at models uh, uh, and examples, things that are developing more in the Catalonian region and some of the more left-oriented pieces uh, that are now developing uh, in the Basque country, I think are far more parallel to what we are trying to do uh, uh, now uh, and why we have extended relations with them and trying to deepen that so we can do some cross-exchange there. Um, uh, the piece, you know, I'm trying to speed up because there's a lot to answer there. No, I know. I got you. And, you know, um, we, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You know, so just, you know, last couple of minutes. So the piece with um, uh, uh, the, the other piece, you know, nobody's, a, we, we not avoid no criticism uh, uh, at all. And the piece, what I would say, uh, uh, was just saying earlier, is that to, you know, we have not become fully independent in the way that we were hoping to by this particular point, point in time. And there's still a great deal of, of uh, subsidization uh, that we are dealing with from from sponsorship to be able to do and execute large parts of our program. So the the, the pieces, particularly that we're responding to, like this current water crisis that the city is going through, we would not be able to do any of that uh, uh, if we were totally relying upon the the, the profits that the co-ops are, are are generating. Uh, a, they're not generating enough to do that level of subsidization, and then the scale of the problem that we have, uh, which is a citywide problem. Uh, we also have to be mindful and clear that we're doing something that's resilient. It's not a solution unto itself, right? Us putting uh, uh, water tanks on every single home in Jackson actually wouldn't solve the problem. We don't have the resources to do that. So there's still the political struggle to have to be uh, engaged uh, 
uh, to be able to resolve many, many of these problems. And without a certain level of outside support from supporters, none of this is going to be possible in terms of the broader piece around the, the, the decaying and collapsing infrastructure that the city is dealing with. Uh, and then we have to figure out this piece, you know, relative to the criticism uh, uh, that was waged. A, it's, it's not false. It's false to say that we don't have uh, or any or they don't have internal economy. That is, a, you know, that's a, a, a particular uh, a view uh, coming from a more anarchist perspective that we can struggle about, you know, another point in time. Um, but, you know, the, the piece that we have to deal with is that other than folks being able to return resources back internally to pay for the capitalization that the the uh, the nonprofit is bought for, uh, they are able to kind of fend for themselves, but there's not enough money to say that I'm going to now, you know, uh, uh, develop a whole nother co-op. We have not gotten to that level. The productive capacity of the farm, of the CPC, uh, of uh, the green team, uh, the composting, they've done enough to develop internal economies. Uh, but they are not, you know, bought enough to like say, hey, you know, any of them is going to be a sponsor of uh, I mix what I like or Black Power Media on, on any extensive level for a long period of time. You know, maybe a couple of hundreds of dollars here and there. But to say that we would be like a sponsor for a year, $10,000, we ain't there yet, uh, yet, particularly coming off the pandemic. Uh, but what one thing that I think, you know, we the pandemic was good to us. And that it allowed for uh, a level of uh, consolidation that we didn't have before the pandemic. Uh, but we are now facing some new challenges that the Jackson Cush plan and our strategy didn't see. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've been through this before, so I think I have a little bit more to speak on. And maybe this is a comeback. But while I say I've been through this before, it doesn't mean the organization has been through this before. You know, one of the things I, I helped to do in, in, in the many lifetimes that I kind of uh, uh, live was start uh, a school in Oakland, California. And I thought that uh, that was going to be kind of my life's work. And then the Oakland Unified School District went, went belly up. Uh, and that changed that real quick. But what it exposed to me was there was a blind side that I had and me and the comrades that helped found the school that uh, we took that society was was unstable. But we, we, we kind of held an unconscious assumption that the U.S. government was going to be a stable entity, right? And that proved out to, that turned out to be false. I think mm -hmm. we have made a similar kind of calculation uh, here in Jackson with the Jackson Kush plan uh, that our effort at-, at uh, In terms of the stability of the local government. There you go. Well, in terms of stability of the local government, but also in terms of the stability of the population that, that had the type of politics mm -hmm. that would support, you know, these kind of radical ideas being at the forefront. You know, uh, Jackson is shrunk, man. Uh, uh, so, if, you know, if you believe that the U.S. government and, and I got, you know, in terms of the census, I got reason to doubt it. Just knowing black people in our history of not wanting to be counted too much. Mm -hmm. But there's some truth to it, you know, uh, not absolute. But, you know, just, just so the audience knows in terms of clear numbers, the 2010 uh, census said that the city had over 180,000 people. The 2020 census said that we were down to about 165,000 people. So if you just take that, the city, the city lost 20,000 people in a 10 year period. And with this crisis deepening with the collapse of our water infrastructure uh, uh, and, and that not being clear, you know, in terms of it, is it gonna hold up to be drinkable uh, 365 days of the year, folks are gonna have to start making some rational decisions, decisions as to whether this is a viable place for their kids and for them to build a future. And, and we already see folks kind of leaving with their feet, which puts a major strain and challenge on our, on our co-ops as it, as it would on any business. I mean, you, you know, some of the things that have been happening here uh, where since the pandemic, where I kind of, you know, you, you, people take this with a grain of salt, but when uh, uh, Hooters, and uh, uh, Twin Peaks um, and other kind of restaurant chains like that disappear from your town, which they've disappeared from Jackson. Uh, the nature of, of how this sexism and misogyny sells. That's a bad sign. Part. Yeah, if you can't sustain you, that. If you can't you sustain wings, wings and breasts. <laughs> you're in trouble, man. So... Woo! Uh, yeah, is, that's that's 
Yeah. This is what we're facing, you know. Uh, so that's why I was saying, you know, we 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 now have to recalculate. I think internally, one of the next phases of where I think this organization has to really deal with the next ten years. Uh, we've created a certain level of stabilization for many of our units, uh, which totally runs counter to that criticism. But we now have to figure out how do we move to stabilize. Um, uh, uh, a kind of a, a internal economy in a shrinking city, and that is a piece that we're gonna have to to really look at and figure out. I think in the near term, and I say that because, you know, uh, just to take a little bit more time, I want folks to to fully understand part of the criticism. So let me uh, uh, slow down, or part of the reality. Let me say. So let me slow down just a quick second and take more time. So in 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 uh, last August, uh, the Jackson's water system collapsed. Right, it just basically stopped functioning, uh, and we went without uh, portable water, drinkable water, in the city for three solid weeks throughout the entire city, and then it extended for three more weeks in in certain sections of the city. Right, as the system got back up. Now, the problem with our system is, one, antiquated pipes, which are lead-based, you know, which are leaching contaminants because they've been in them, some of them down there over 150 years. So they're old, they're corroded. Then the other pieces are, are uh, filtering facilities also are chronically under-resourced and also antiquated. So we can't pump and filter water securely, and the delivery system is also messed up. It's going to take roughly between six and ten billion dollars. That's with a B, billion dollars to overhaul this system. Jackson's annual kind of city budget, again, this is it's shrinking, is the largest budget I think we've ever had. Only constituted about seven hundred fifty million dollars, and that happened I think on occasion twice: once by Chokeway and then once by Chokeway Antar. And I'm citing that so folks understand that. If we spent every penny of our annual budget just fixing the water, it would take about 15 years to cover that, you know, that, that level of debt, if not more. So this is not going to be repaired unless there's some extensive support from the state government, which is not going to happen here in Mississippi, uh, given the nature of how, uh, you know, the neo-Confederate uh, uh, Republican supermajority exists and, and wants to move, you know, the eye stain of, of black power uh, in Jackson gone. Uh, and it's not clear that the federal government would be able to deliver in any fundamental fashion without some major uh, uh, overhaul as to how it actually delivers resources to municipalities. Right now, the money that's secured and has been secured by like Benny Thompson that goes to the state and then the state determines where those resources go and they do not have to give them to Jackson. And I say that because that just happened, this legislative facility. Benny, uh, uh, Congressman Thompson, uh, was able to secure roughly a billion dollars in funding from that last closeout uh, uh, period in uh, December 2020, I mean 2022. Well, when that came to the state of Mississippi, they said, thank you, but that ain't, we're not gonna hardly see one penny of that go to Jackson. We're going to take that billion dollars because it comes to the state and reallocate that to our pet projects all throughout the state to make sure Jackson uh, continues to suffer. So this is the, the intentional level in which this city and this project is being dismantled and is what we are going to have to learn how to adjust to in the, in the future uh, to kind of save ground on this particular experiment in building black power, because that is what it is, y'all. This has been an experiment uh, to do that. And I think in both with what we have done right and both what we have done wrong, what we have accomplished, what we have failed to accomplish, there's some hell of a, a stories to be and lessons to be learned here from over the past, you know, I would say 12, 15 to 12, 15 years uh, that are applicable to any and everywhere within the U.S. empire that folks are trying to uh, 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 liberate black people. 
Oh man, uh, so much to say, so much to 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 get into, but uh, uh, we'll just leave that as a teaser for the next time, and we'll just have to <laughs> to schedule you to get back sooner than it took to get you back from the last visit. Um, we'll do that. We'll do it, and I'm gonna make sure uh, I'm I'm someplace where the video actually works, and we can be uninterrupted. So well, I, at I, one point, I should audience. just come down there. That's I've never even hey, done that, there you so go. I should just do that. Um, there you go. But but and then we both just be stalled up and hesitant on the bad Wi-Fi down there, <laughs> you know. But no, I'm bougie now, so I'll get a, I'll get a nice hotel somewhere not too far away. <laughs> anyway, I'm just playing. Listen, man, it's always a pleasure, man. Shout out to you and your family. And uh, um, anytime you or any one of your 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 comrades uh, want to come back for for conversation, criticism, whatever, just holler at me and 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 we'll we'll work it out. But thank you very okay. much, Kylie. Appreciate All you. Right, man. Appreciate y'all. All right. All right, peace now. Take care. Um, all right, everybody. Uh, I have about, I have, a, I have a little bit of time. Uh, so if you all can bear with me, what I will do is, um, what I'm going to do is a, a quick, a, a quick transition, and then we'll come back and get into a couple things. So don't go anywhere. Back in just a second. <laughs> I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, everybody. Big shout out to Kali Akuno. Uh, and um, yeah, I appreciate him taking the time to come through. There, I, I do wish he had more time. So I look forward to, to the next uh, visit. Um, and uh Thank you very much, Afro Lion Pride, Pride Tunes. Uh, you got paid today, so thank you for putting five on us over here. And I, you know, let me just be honest, McGaigle Meister. I saw this uh, and when you put it up, and uh, just be primarily because I knew Kylie didn't have the time, and because I am biased in terms of my my own, you know you know, going back a little bit with with him. I didn't want to throw that at him uh, just on his way out. Uh, and I think he's got a little bit more of a complicated nuanced situation down there and would have either wanted him to take the time to have a chance to really respond and thoughtfully or to engage the critique. Uh, but, um, you know, so just keeping it real, just being honest. I, I didn't want to, you know, it's not, you know, uh, just where my biases are and all of that, the shortcomings that as they may be, just so you all know, um, I want, I would have wanted him to have an appropriate, uh, time and chance to respond to that um let me let me there, there are a couple of things though that i would have wanted to raise that i mentioned just very briefly i want to just show this here because this is this is i think an important point from from uh both in terms of my own work and that um so this is this is from the book entrepreneurship and self-help among black americans reconsideration of race and economics the revised edition that uh, um, Cooperation Jackson makes mention of in at least the rising redux. I can't remember if it was in the original or not. And they say that this is this is where they get a good you know uh, um, bit of their uh, approach to cooperatives. And this is from where uh, almost one of the concluding chapters or the, the penultimate uh, chapter. And after going through this history of not just cooperatives, but per se, but black entrepreneurialism, as I said, I do not agree. I think I, I obviously haven't read the whole book, but from what I did read, I, do, I don't agree with this idea that there's a there's a greater degree of an entrepreneurial spirit among immigrants that uh among those immigrants who are closer to their point of immigration. With this idea that black people have lost somehow some sort of entrepreneurial spirit over time and that this is uh, at all to do with the inequality that black people still face. I don't think that's it at all. If anything, over time, people realize that their entrepreneurial spirit is insufficient. It doesn't solve anything. Um, so it's not that black people don't have an entrepreneurial spirit. And in fact, as we keep that, that, that stat, I keep citing 2 million businesses from 1992 to 2012. In fact, this book 
initial in its first edition sort of ends its analysis right at 1992. And at a point where it's claiming there's a there's a there's a a, 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 a a downward turn in entrepreneurial spirit. And I'm saying, well, right after you wrote that. For the next 20 years, black people created two million businesses and lost capture of the national sales revenue to below one percent. So. That's not the answer, but then as as the author says here. This is sort of my point. Although these firms, meaning businesses, will never be able to hire all Afro-Americans or create an Afro-American economy, they are in the tradition of un enterprises developed by members of a group that has been historically oppressed. Afro-American entrepreneurs of today will represent the truly advantaged of the disadvantage. That's it. That's ultimately all my point is. So I'm not saying don't start businesses, don't start cooperatives. I'm just simply saying they're not, they can't solve the problem. At best, it'll create a business class of the truly advantaged among the disadvantaged. Or at best, you'll have pockets to the extent that we're not supporting them grow of radical cooperatives who can't expand because they don't have enough support. Or really one of the points I was even going to raise in terms of the Mondragon example, because I've been hearing this for decades. People keep making this. I'm glad Kali pointed out their right would turn because most people don't have any details or, 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 or analysis of Mondragon. They just keep mentioning it. But if you also look up Mondragon, especially today, uh, uh, they produce rare machinery. In other words, they're in an area of the economy, a sector of the global economy that is that is wealth producing and uh, narrow enough to not have a lot of competition because it's hard, you can't, who, who has the ability to produce rare machinery at a, at a level, uh, uh, um, uh, at a productive capacity that will generate wealth. And then to the, to, to also to the point, it's still just Mondragon. What about the rest of Spain? What about the rest of the Basque region? What about the rest of Europe? What about the rest, the rest, the rest? So in other words, this, this, the, and they have support from Spain. They have political relationships and power that, that black people do not have vis-a-vis -vis the United States. So these comparisons, I really struggle with them. Um, but this is ultimately my point as this book here concludes. after, And this is after the book goes through and it's very similar. I'm going to pull it up here to what 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 I see in in the shortcomings of Jessica Nemhard's work as I read her essay in 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 this um, Jackson Rising book. And again, I'm not. This is not personal. Like I, I for a time shared office space with the sister. She's been on my radio show. I've reached out to her on a number of occasions for interviews to discuss this off or on air. I've sent her drafts of my own work inviting her to be critical or to just offer her thoughts. And I don't, there's, I've invited her on. I, so it's not, it's not me. And it's, and it's only to raise what I think, what, what I don't know, maybe it doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter. But um, here it is. In her essay, uh, uh, in her essay in the Jackson Rising book, you know, she's talking about a long, strong history with Southern roots. Uh, African Americans, as well as other people of color and low income people, have benefited greatly from cooperative ownership throughout the history of the US, similar to their counterparts around the world. So what she does here and in her broader work is the same thing that um, what's his name did in his other book that I was just um, um, Butler uh, or is it Butler? Yeah, I'll check again in a second that he does in, in his where they give these and I've seen done actually in a number of, of articles, at least they give an overview of cooperatives, but they only talk about or or. Primarily, the focus is the development of the cooperative and not a detailed analysis of what happened to it and many others. Because 
for all of the the lists and summaries and passing by references to to past co cooperatives where are they what happened to them because we know the end result today is a black population that is largely in terms of the US black american example in history that is largely broke and headed towards zero wealth by 2053 so in other words we get all of the look at the, this cooperative and this cooperative existed and these cooperatives exist and these are these are cooperatives that we can emulate but what happened to them it reminds me that that what was that article i read about the oh man there's so many that the, about black banks and it was like look this black bank and that black bank but what happened to them how did we go from 130 to 20 or 21 or whatever they are today and then what value is it? What happened to them? We don't get that. So there's no, and I'm open if I've missed it, if I haven't read carefully enough, please let me know. But but whether it's this chapter or or in in her broader work, there's there's no explanation of of well, this would work, but this is what happened and why it failed. Or or this is why if we do it again this way in the 21st century, as opposed to what happened last century or a few decades ago. Uh, this is what would provide the key difference in uh, of those examples and show why it's not that it was a bad idea. It just it just didn't work then and it can work now. Um, so, for instance, what I would have to do to be fair to my own cr criticism is when I make reference to Abram Harris in the 1930s saying Black capitalists and Black entrepreneurs and Black businesses don't work. It's a tradition of failure, this, that, and the third. But then I understand he comes back later to be more critical of his more radical... So I don't know in what ways he became more conservative. I would have to be... If, if I was to do what I am critical of, and I'll, and I'll explain more in just a second, of Jessica gordon Emhart doing, or what others have done in terms of Amos Wilson, uh, and to, like what Amos Wilson have done with Du Bois, if I, if I want to be fair or or outside of any contradiction or hypocrisy, I would then have to go and read, which I haven't done yet, the later work of Abram Harris to see how he later became critical of his earlier work and in which ways he was critical. Does he just become conservative and ignore his early work? Or does he come back and say, this is why my criticism of black businesses was wrong. And this is why black businesses would work today. I would have to do that. And I will, I will uh, to, see, to, to check to see if he does that. Um, but anyway, so, but, but as Nemhar does here, it's, it's again, a lot of claims without, I think, appropriate levels of, of, of support. Pursuit of economic alternatives and solidarity econ economic relationships were part of this struggle and resistance, even in the face of sabotage and violence, we produce, we practice cooperatives and collective economics. She mentions Du Bois, Garvey, Nanny Helen Burroughs, and, and several others. Schuyler gets more attention in her book. But then this line here, and this is in the 2023 re-release of Jackson Rising Redux. W.E.B. Du Bois proposed economic cooperation as the only effective and practical solution throughout his life. It's factually incorrect. I played the video, it's linked in the show description below where he says they don't work. He leaves as a socialist. He gives up his American engagement entirely. So how, how he advocated for socialism. He advocated for radical approaches to the vote. I don't understand this claim at all. And it's not supported. Du Bois argued that the African American, and by the way, when you look up the citation, and I, okay, Du Bois argued that African Americans must become the masters of their own economic destiny. Blacks could position ourselves at the forefront of developing new forms of industrial organization that would free us from the mar from marginal economic status. He advocated using intelligent cons consumer economic cooperation as an important approach. He advanced the concept of strategy of racial economic cooperation, combining cooperative in industries and separate and services in a group economy through which African Americans could use their sense of solidarity, gain control of their economic lives and assert themselves as equals, even leaders in the mainstream economy. We can, we can buy consumers and, and producers. We can, we can buy consumers and producers cooper, cooperate. I'm 
we can buy consumers and producers cooperation, establish a progressively self-supporting economy that will will weld the majority of our people into impregnable into an impregnable economic phalanx. So this is my point. Professor Nemhard is making this claim or quoting Du Bois as saying that we can, by consumption and produ production, cooperation and consumption and production, become an impregnable economic phalanx. But if you look up the citation for that, the right of the, the right to work, it's written in the 1930s. And then there's no subsequent follow-up by Nemhard or anyone else that I'm seeing uh, who's making this claim to say, well, no, later on he changed this, but this is why his 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 critique was was wrong. And here's why we can adopt what he said in the 30s and make it applicable to today. So she doesn't do that. So, for instance, this is why I made a note here. I highlighted Gary in Indiana because she's mentioning Jacob Reddick's co-founder of the Consumers Consumers Cooperative Trading Company in Gary, Indiana, as a as a list of things as examples of these cooperatives. But Gary, Indiana, look at what happened to Gary, Indiana. I was just there a couple of years ago, and you can see the brother that I was that that was that that we pointed this out to me from there showed it to you. Can see how the white folks literally picked up, went right down the street, created a whole new municipality and took all of their tax revenue, took all of their political power, took all of their consumer power, took all of their whatever oh, down the street and left Gary in his, as an empty skeletal shell of poverty. So, so th this is the point I'm getting at. It's yes, it's, it's great to attempt cooperation. It's great to do whatever oppressed people can do to get over, to survive, to whatever. Fine. But it clearly didn't work. And there's no, I don't, there's no sufficient attempt to explain. And then we're left with what we end up here. Quoting, who's she quoting here? She's quoting the guy I'm talking about concluded a nationwide system of African-American cooperative businesses could lift the burden of economic exploitation from the back backs of African-Americans. Okay, a, a socialist revolution could lift the burden of economic exploitation. America becoming a communist state could lift, uh, 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 a decolonial overthrow could lift the burden. A number of things could lift the burden. The point, though, is that in an, in an attempt to make an argument in defense of cooperatives to suggest that the history of cooperatives is evidence that they would work, I think is 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 not a well made argument. Anyway, so that I mean, and it's it's more of the same of of uh, uh, you know. So so I, I uh, um. And then I did. I was gonna get. Kali's too serious sometimes. I, I I I I can't I can't get in my jokey mode with him too much. But 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 you know because Richard Wolf writes the introduction to the to the to the rising redux, and he talks about Mondragon and the power of cooperatives and and um, you know. So I wanted to tell Kali, tell Richard. I said, "What's up?" <laughs> and and we could take we could take any reluctance to talk to black people off his list as to why he wouldn't come on here. Right. So maybe, maybe, you know, there's another, there's other reasons. Uh, uh, anyway. Uh, but I think actually that's it. I think that's all I had. Um, anybody got any questions, comments for me? What can I do? Anything other than just stay here to provide the chat. It's reason for, I don't, um, maybe, I guess, I don't, you know, I, his, I mean, I get his argument in the Redux intro. He's talking about cooperatives as the, as, as what will help us as a society transition into a socialist economy by demonstrating democracy in the workplace. So I get that. Um, 
But he mentions Madrigal too, but doesn't do it in a way that I think he doesn't do any of the things that I'm thinking keep lacking when I've been hearing about. He doesn't explain how that exact example is something to be duplicated by black people here. I don't, I don't, I don't think that I don't, I don't think it can be. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I was good. I was good. I was I had a couple little jokes. I thought I might throw, you know. Uh, anyway, any comment? Uh, exactly. I like summer break too. I like being on here more. Oh, word up, word up. Definitely want to catch that. Definitely want to catch that. Um, but it's only audio though. Y'all didn't, you didn't get video of that? Shame, shameful, shameful. Shameful. I didn't say throw it out as unusable, but but again, when you say it worked for a period of time, my question still remains, how did it work? And how is the way that it worked something that would be duplicated here? Because I keep hearing black people and others say Mondragon, we could do like Mondragon, but I don't hear them explaining what Mondragon actually did, how it got there. And when I've looked at it, whatever, including just last night, I'm looking at a, a special set of circumstances that a handful of Europeans were able to pull off at a very specific time, making rightward turns, as Kali pointed out in the 90s, and then ultimately ensconcing themselves in 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 an area, in a sector of the economy that is almost exclusive to them and wealth producing in terms of producing rare machinery without any real competition. How does that translate into something that black people can duplicate? So I'm not saying throw anything out. I'm simply, what I am saying is when you and others keep wanting to throw it in, I don't see how the, ex I don't see how the explanation works. Mondragon, Mondragon, cool, cooperative, cool. Specifically, what did they do? How did they do it? How did they sustain it? And how does that work here? I don't see it. I haven't seen that explanation yet. And, and Wolf didn't make the argument well enough or at all. I didn't see it either. So, oh, you did get the PowerPoint. Okay, my bad, my bad. I thought it said, I thought I saw on the, the, the YouTube hit, it was, it was audio only, but okay, good. Thank you again, ZZ Lion, uh, Lion, Dad. Comment, Afro-pessimism is a great critique of these leftist movements once we are liberated. I, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not, what do you mean, what was the point? What was the point? They cornered a market. Okay, but... But you do realize that cornering a market is a monopolist exclusive thing that it, by definition can't be duplicated. So in other words, so I get it. You're saying, well, Jared, I'm saying corner another market. <laughs> okay. <coughs> what market? How would it be cornered? How would, how would black people develop the productive capacity to corner any market? How did Mondragon corner the market? Do black people have the same relationship to get, what is it, 50,000 50, acres of land that can then be produced upon? Who's doing it? Where is that going to happen? Who's got that? What, what is, where is that? Where's Mondragon's relationship with the Basque community and with Spain? What was it? Is it? And how do black people duplicate that? I mean, that's deep. So I don't, that's that's the part I'm getting at. So when I saw Richard Wolf wrote the thing and I see him mention Mondragon, I was like, okay, here we go. No, he did the same thing. Mondragon is an example. This group in Romania is an example. This group, how? 
Now that said, I don't want my critique of this to be confused with my with with a criticism or a condemnation of people attempting to do it. I'm not. That's not the same thing. I'm. I'm. I. I am, if anything, critical of the produced arguments, some of the the published arguments, and some of the claims in the chat, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> the black Bitcoin market, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Um, just corner it, I know. I know you can't do exactly, but that's my point. But people like you keep throwing it in my face. So that's the thing. You can't just throw up Mondragon. And then say, but you can't do it like they did it. If you can't do it like they did it, then you can't use it as an example. <laughs> or, or, or take the steps to explain how here's what they did. Because this is a part, again, I don't see this in any of these discussions or even in these writings. Here's exactly what they did. Because again, I looked it up last night and I don't see that as something that could be duplicated. Again, five or six people with resources, getting access to land, getting investments, getting cornering them all, you know, relationships politically. But but I would again, I'm happy to be proven wrong. I, come on here and explain it or write it up and I'll read it. Create the video and we'll play it. Here's what Mondragon did. Not just that it existed, here's what they did. Here's what we cannot do, but here's what we can do. And here's how we'll make that history relevant to our example and condition today. So that's all I'm asking for. I haven't seen that argument yet, I, but I would like to see it if it exists. But it can't just be, I'm not asking you to plan on YouTube comments. That's what I'm saying. Show me where anyone anywhere has done this work or when you create it, Send it to me and we'll bring it back. I, obviously, I'm not expecting it to be done in the comments. I'm saying, show me where anyone has ever done it. Anywhere. Show me the explanation. And I'll happily read it. I can't find it. I've never seen it. It's unfortunately not in the Rising books, Redux or otherwise. It's not in Wolf's introduction. It's not in the write-ups about Mondragon that I read last night. It's not. It's not, but cool, deal, bet, challenge. <laughs> hey, man, I, man, I'm not trying to avoid the, the, the data. So if it's there, I want to see it. Uh, and, and, you know, um, but anyway, that, but, you know. He is. I think Kali is very practical versus ideal. And I think this is part of the point and why I respect him and what they're doing so much. There, there, there is an attempt. People moved to Jackson to make an attempt. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by that. I'm, I'm humbled by that. Uh, it doesn't mean that it answers all my questions and it doesn't mean that it's, oh, it's the end all the be all, but it's just that, but, but, and that's what Kali was saying. And I think he was being polite and saying, maybe even to me and others, we're trying, this is a messy, difficult process. And he's acknowledging there are things we didn't consider. And I, I would have never considered it either. What you mean Jackson as a city is going to collapse? I don't know that we could have, I don't, I, I mean, it's, it's again, just as he said about his experience in Oakland, I didn't, it, it, I didn't see the potential for a local, a city's school system to, to, to evaporate or whatever. I get it. So I'm, I'm, I'm fully supportive and appreciate what they're doing. Oh yeah, I, I'm. I think if I had to pick one, Michael Hudson. I, yeah, and Michael Hudson answers my emails. <laughs> so that alone, 
Uh, but Michael Hudson is, 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 I think, very sharp. Very, very sharp. And uh, he was just back again with Ben Norton recently. You know, they got a regular thing. And so, like, like I'm very happy to see that happen, too. So, um, all right, let me just do a quick check here. I think what, what's coming up, we got Black Myths is uh, dropping their thing tonight at 8 o'clock. I'll be back tomorrow at 11 a.m. with Dr. Burroughs to talk about King, a life. Warrior class tomorrow at 1 o'clock. On the 31st, Dr. Ashley Farmer is going to join me to talk about Queen Mother Moore. Real Talk Black Liberation is, is, is back next month as well. So a lot of stuff. Make sure you have the bell rung so you don't miss anything. Please do like, share, and subscribe. Do all of those good things. And again, thank you all for joining me who are here live and those who will see this later. Thanks to you as well. Peace if you're willing to fight for it like Fred Hampton used to say, and I'll catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like and throughout the BPM platform. So peace, everybody. Thanks again. I mix what I, I mix, like, what I, I like. Mix, what I like. Mix,